do that. Don't do that. Are you there? I don't see you guys. Ah, there you are. Vote, run, lead. That's where we are today. So we're starting out with, I had the banner up a little early. That's for my guest, Jamu Green, who's going to be joining us in a couple minutes. Jamu is a correspondent at television. Her job is to give perspective on the other side to people at Fox. I mean, come on. What a great place to be at, to be able to give them a little bit of the real world. Not that people are probably taking it over there. Anyway, welcome, everybody. It is 420 Live. I am your host, Jeff Kravitz. It is Friday. As you know, I usually come to you Monday through Friday at 420 to bring you a little levity, to bring you a distraction, to take you away from all the craziness in our world that we've been focusing on. The, the pandemic now switched into riot and uh, protest mode as we protest uh, George Floyd and the way he was taken off our planet and the way that our society is dealing with the protests now. It's day 11 or 12. I, I'm losing count. I just can't believe that the protest has gone on this long. It's been in all 50 states. It's been in almost 20 countries. Uh, this is the first time that the civil un unrest has struck where people have protested in all 50 states that I can remember uh, that I've seen it everywhere in Idaho, <laughs> which is not exactly your bastion of democratic uh, freedom and, and free thought. People are protesting. P people are protesting all over the United States. And the difference now and the thing that amazes me is that we all knew the revolution was going to be televised, but we didn't realize that the people televising it were going to be the people that were getting attacked. And what you're seeing now, the footage coming out over the past couple of days of how the different police departments have handled this badly has to, just reinforces everything that the protest is about. Everything I've seen on TV, all the actions, most of the actions, I'm not saying all the police, but most of the actions from when I've seen that these police in these riots swinging batons at white, black, brown, yellow. They don't care about the color, don't care about the age. That poor guy in Buffalo, 75 years old, shoved down in broad daylight in in front of a camera, the police are acting like nobody's watching. And just because they put a little tape over their body cam, that nobody's ever going to see the videos. And that's not the case. We're in a new era. And the amount of videos that are coming out now, the reports, my daughter today shared a report from a USC student who went down to protest and was locked in a bus for five hours with everybody's hands behind their back with no bathroom, no charges. We have turned into the worst I just, it's so hard for me to wrap my head around. And every day, it just seems to get a little bit more crazy and just a little bit more out of reach for us to grasp what is happening in our world. So as I do, I beat myself up because we were on a blackout all week and I wanted to come live. I wanted to talk to you guys. And on Monday, I brought some people that were down on the front line, a couple of photographers that were out there photographing the protests. And, you know, the one thing about the blackout that everybody said was that you should take this time to amplify the messages of the voices around you that have been under the thumb, under the knee all this time. So I started doing a little research. I watched this crazy documentary called The 13th. I don't know if you've seen it. It's been out a couple of years now. It's on Netflix, but it basically explains why we're in this mess. And it's basically because the South never gave up the fact that they lost the Civil War. And then for another 150 years, we've been dealing with the repercussions of just that, that you took away their main source of income when you freed the slaves, you took away their workforce, the prison system. Oh God, I just, I learned so much and it's just all so disturbing because it's all in my brain on top of everything else that for years, for years, for years, we all think that we're in touch. We all think that we're racially sensitive. We all think that we know what it's like, that we can understand that we can get in the heads of other people and have empathy. And it's hard and it's really hard because I'm not put in that situation like people are. People I've been prejudged, but usually because I'm just big and tall and goofy looking. So it doesn't really come back where that happens because you're white, you're privileged. And that's kind of what it's been now for a long time. And what we're seeing in America, this swing back is a result of this happening for years and years and years. So I can only talk about this so much. I needed a voice, an expert. And as I racked my brain to go through the people in my life I've knew, I came across Jamu Green and her and I have been friends for a long time since 2000. She was working with Rock the Vote. I was an MTV photographer and she'd be at these events, a big, bright smile, smart, articulate. And Rock the Vote, I'm just going to run a couple stats for you. 
they went from 1500 to a million people supporting rock the vote they had 1.4 million new voters over 200 celebrities signed up to be part of the rock the vote campaign I'm not seeing that right now. I see the celebrities get involved, but I'm not seeing that kind of drive that, that Rock the Vote did. And mostly I would guess, and Jimmy will probably correct me, but I think it was because of MTV and what MTV's power was back at that time. An 11% increase in voter turnout. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Jamu. Hey, I'm a poet too. Yeah. How are you? Look at you. I am good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. It is so good to see your face. And I, I know we have a lot of really serious things to talk about, but I, I, have to, I have to share with you what I was telling a friend before we started this conversation today about us, our relationship. Because back in 2000, when you were at all of the red carpets and all of the big events, you were the only photographer out of many at those events who saw me, who saw me as the young black girl I was trying to do good in a world of major players in the entertainment industry, the chairman of Viacom, the president of MTV, the head of Sony, all of these people were my bosses. And, you know, I was 26 years old, rarely seen in LA, but every single time you were in the room on a carpet, it wasn't that you saw me through your lens, you saw me for who I was and what I was bringing to the, to the conversation, to the table, to our efforts. And I have, to, I have to say that because I think what we're going through right now as a country moving through this collective trauma to collect what can be a collective breakthrough, there are a lot of stories that people need to hear about behavior they've had for, for many years. And I, I think it's also important, not all of those stories are um, what someone has done to put someone under the thumb, uh, because what you did for me and seeing me was to really lift me up. So I appreciate you. Well, and you I know, once I connect with somebody and, and, I, and I know them and I understand where they're coming from and what they're doing and how important your job was at that time, because we'd been under Republican rule for quite a while before that came about. So it was really a change in a lot of things that happened. And one of the things that was most interesting was how all the celebrities got on board with you. I mean, talk about you having touch at 26 years old with every amazing thinker and mover in the country. We had fun. And uh, we we had impact, but I I, I have never seen the, the type of impact and the potential for impact as great as it is right now. What we are witnessing, what we have seen this past week, as as brutal as it is, as tough as it is, as challenging as this road is going to be, this is a this is a moment that um, even as a very optimistic activist. I didn't necessarily think I'd see in my lifetime. And now that we are, it's good to be here. Well, they talk about ripping the Band-Aid off. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I would say that you know, that Band-Aid has been ripped off for many people. All what has been ripped off for the Black community. What, what we have now seen is kind of this collective breakthrough of white people understanding what we have been screaming at them for so long. And I, I just have to say the young organizers who started uh, in Ferguson and every single name that we have to remember, every single death, every single video that has happened since then, you know, people may think, oh, you know, people protest and then it goes away. It's kind of up and down, up and down. The result, what we are seeing right now in the streets is the result of consistent activism, organizing the Black Lives Matter movement, these community organizations, these local leaders who have been consistently pushing this and were uh, very sadly in some ways ready for this moment. And, and we, we owe that to them. Change does not happen by chance. It, it is on the backs of many people who have been putting literally blood into into this fight and so it's good it, it's good to have now that scene uh I, I think being amplified where it needed to be for the type of change that needs to happen 
No, I just think it's interesting that it goes back so freaking long that it's just been so systematic. F when I went back and was doing my history, it was like after the Civil War, that's when everything went to hell because the South lost their four million free employees. That that is certainly a a key moment, Jeff. But I would say it even goes back further than that when I mean, we're talking like almost five hundred years when the Roman Catholic Church said that it was okay to enslave black people and to do that for money, for greed. Uh, the reason that they gave for white supremacy in, in, in that time was based on greed. And, and, and so they had to devalue black people. So we're not just talking 150 years. We're talking 500 years right. of bullshit, and, and and to think of the the type of rage that is instilled in DNA even uh, of black people, that is what is coming to light for the nation. I think in some very raw, very brutal, very necessary ways. Yeah, well, you see it right in your face and the news is unfolding so fast that it's hard to even keep track of what's going on because everybody every time you turn around there's another violation there's another cop doing something wrong there's another protest i mean it's just unbelievable and some people would say and that's just another tuesday jeff that's <laughs> just another that, tuesday that's just enough that is how black people in this country have felt for a long time and you know and i say this wearing full-on like lips in the shape of the American flag. I, I love this country. I am the daughter of undocumented immigrants, former undocumented immigrants. I have gotten to live in so many ways the American dream. I love this country uh, in ways that, you know, I even people in my family tease me about it at times. But what this country is going through right now is, I think, the first time that we are about to live up to the promise of America. And that promise is, is something that everyone can get involved in. Uh, a lot of people have been absent from that conversation, blinded by privilege, blinded by uh, you know solely looking at what their life is, what is in front of you and, and what is affecting your family and, and the people that you know, but you, you can't watch a man be choked out for nine minutes while people stand around and the, the people that are paid to protect us are the murderers and turn a blind eye. George Floyd uh, will uh, be a turning point that, again, I, I wasn't sure was going to happen in our lifetime. So let's get at it. Well, do you think they're trying to protect the police or uh, uh, trying to protect the status quo? They just want to keep everything... Oh. They, they want to, the police want to keep it as it's going. They don't want any change. They like it the way it is because they're in charge and they're, they're dominant and they can put people under their thumb. You know, I, I, I can't assign all of the reasons behind the, the militarization, the brutality, the lack of accountability uh, that we have seen um, time and time again play out when it's clear as day on the video. This person was unarmed. This person was pleading for their life. This person was murdered in front of you and there has been no accountability. I, I can't assign what those specific individuals um, who are involved at all levels of that decision-making, but holistically what it adds up to is systemic racism. And, and to see mayors and to see President Obama just the other day lay out eight things that can happen without the fool in the White House being involved at all. So th this is not about Trump. We, we can only talk about this conversation in, in kind of the, the lane of what Trump is doing or how he's responding to it, because that, that would be criminal to this movement. So this is something mayors can do. This is something our local and state leaders can do. They can change policing. They can change those budgets. Anytime someone has money and you're saying, I'm gonna take money away from you, it's gonna be a fight. 
well, this is a fight that people are ready to have that we're seeing mayors step up to and say, we're going to make these changes. Think of all of the different things that police respond to that you don't even necessarily need someone to respond to who has a gun, who has a weapon. And I'm, I'm coming at you from Texas where we love our guns, <laughs> but why do we need an armed officer of the government for probably 50% of the things that police officers do. So what do you think? So you have a, like a social worker come out first or something like that when there's issues or different kinds of issues rather than a police officer? How do you- uh... Certainly employ a, a, a different vision of what public service looks like, what protecting the public looks like, sending some of those resources that have been stockpiling these uh, police budgets in the, even just the last 10 to 20 years, sent, sending those to community um, organizations and, 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 and the activism that is happening in those communities to, to rebuild that relationship between the community and the police. Now, I, I don't think that anyone thinks that you can live in a society without uh, law enforcement, but we certainly can dramatically shift how they are funded, how they are trained, how they are held accountable, how they are tracked, the tracking of this brutality that just hasn't existed. We just have not tracked who's getting killed, who's doing the killing, and like the, the Catholic Church did, who, who gets moved after they have been let go from one police department for brutality and then lo and behold, six months later, they're in another police department. There are things that we can do that because of this moment, because of George Floyd's murder, that I think have not been possible for, for some time. And, and so Jeff, I, I'm very hopeful. Uh, it's, it's hard to be hopeful when yes, you see a 75 year old man bleeding from his ears. And then you saw almost 60 of those police officers resigned. Like something was done to them. Right, because the two, well, they were sticking up for their two guys that got Yeah, it. bye. Good, bye. They Goodbye. shouldn't be on the force. If they are so blind to that, they shouldn't be on the force. What about what, what about the knucklehead in office bringing in all these unmarked, unnamed, unbadged officers in D.C. I saw today? These guys that are just going around and they're like thugs. I think they what I've read is they're getting it from the, the prisons department. The, the guys that went into Washington Square the other day. I mean, I, I don't really know what to believe out there, Jamu, because there's so much information coming at you from so many different ways that it's hard for me to parse it all together. You know, I mean, you end up Googling everything I read to see if it's true. We are certainly at that point where media literacy <laughs> is crucial and it, it, it's our reality, Jeff. If we are not our own personal fact checkers, then the same kind of uh, you know unconscious bias, uh, the media has played a significant role in devaluing the lives of black people to not just uh, bad police officers, but to the entire society. And so it, it's that lack of media literacy that has allowed us to follow those types of narratives. And uh, so whether it is Googling, uh, whether it is finding multiple sources for information that you are receiving, whether it's uh, making sure that you are reading what the other side is putting out, uh, what, how they are framing their narrative, which usually will cast a light on what the bigger real picture is, uh, and also help you actually persuade someone of the opposite. Uh, I, I think that media literacy has to become a core part of how we navigate our days because they, those forces certainly, uh, it's hard to say his name at times, certainly uh, the white supremacist in chief has a, a very strong talent and set of skills when it comes to media manipulation. And we saw that in 2016. I think we're 
he's attempting to do it again. But look, the Washington Monument got struck by lightning. Wow, what a the strike. Too. On our side. Wow, what a strike. That was some of the most intense lightning I've ever seen. I mean, if that, it looked like hell was coming down on Washington, there that was go. nuts. I'm so, checking in with all the evangelicals I know to be like, what's up? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing that he still has support for the evangelicals and, and the religious right are still on his side. But I, I, it seems to me like it's slipping. What I saw with the Defense Department all bucking him, all the guys, all these different generals, everybody's coming up the head of the Pentagon and saying that you're crossing the line by bringing in these people. Talk a little bit because you touched on it a little bit there in your last soliloquy about um, – because you work with Fox and you're the you're our voice of reason trying to tell other Fox people what the other side's view is. Am I characterizing that correctly? Look, so I, I am an activist first. I, I certainly had no vision. Um, when we first met each other, uh, there were lots of cameras around. But my thing was like, how do we register the most amount of voters? How do we make sure that these presidential candidates are actually talking about the issues that young people care about. Um, being on television is, is, is not something that I was uh, compelled to do. Uh, I look at any opportunity to talk to an audience that has the wrong perspective, is on the completely wrong side of history of facts of uh, humanity that I'm going to go in there as an activist, as an organizer, trying to move them <laughs> to <laughs> the right side of history. And anything else uh, I think would be a waste of time. So um, I'm happy to go and talk to as many people as possible who don't agree with me, who uh, certainly may have uh, different thoughts about what a black woman has to say about uh, every issue uh, that I talk about and uh, to get them to see, uh, see things a little differently because opening people's eyes is possible. It, it is possible. That's what's happening right now. This, this is a collective breakthrough that is happening and it, it's going to be real uncomfortable for some folks. I'm getting calls. I don't know the conversations you're having with your friends, Jeff. I'm getting calls from so many of my white friends who have something to say, who want to understand how I'm feeling, who want to. Well, how, how are, tell us, how, how are you feeling? I know you're feeling I feel hopeful. I, I feel good. I feel hopeful. I, I understand the, the, the steps that have taken us to get here, uh, the, the organizers that have put so much work into this moment and that where they are, that this is not something that is going to wane. Um, and so that, that drives me. And then, you know, quite frankly, every day that passes is a day that we get closer to getting our country back. And that means not just, I think at the, White House, but also there are an incredible number of people, women who are running for office. Uh, you think about the pandemic and who had the most impact on your life, your local leaders, the decisions they were making <laughs> about your community, about your safety, and those local leaders, you know, for the first time, you've got a real understanding about the impact. And so when, uh, the organization that I, I try to give my heart and soul to, Vote Run Lead, goes around training women to run for office and win. Uh, this is a much, it's a much easier conversation when people know exactly the power of that mayor, exactly the power of that city council, those county commissioners, and have seen that impact uh, through this lockdown situation. Well, we, we've definitely I seen the lead, the, we've definitely seen who the real leaders are and who's really stepped up. I mean, I think it's yeah. evident when you look at the governors that stepped up. I mean, I thought Newsom was really hot in the beginning and just really blown away with what he did, and then he kind of went soft on me. I, I've just not soft, but I just meant I wasn't really. He wasn't staying on point like Cuomo, but Cuomo lost his weight. I mean, they're all over the place. Because how do you lead in, in a situation that you've never had to deal with before? And I think that that's the thing that they're dealing with shutting down their society and trying to figure out when you could make it okay to go back in. 
and everybody's trying tiptoeing around and all of a sudden you have the George Floyd thing break down and now you look out like I looked at the San Francisco yesterday there'd be 10,000 people out there in the park shoulder to shoulder and you're like wow all of a sudden it's just talk, not only ripping the band-aid off society but ripping the band-aid off our pandemic and everybody at home for months and then finally everybody's out in the streets now and it's kind of like one thing took precedent over the other. Like it's not, the pandemic's not as important as issue. And people are like, we're taking this to the streets. I, I think though, if you, you look at the, the pictures, I dare, there, a lot of those protesters are wearing masks. Uh, I know. Yeah, I, I see that, but it's still, you don't, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Even with the mask or without the mask or. You don't know, but I, I think, you know, to your point about the leadership changes, the ups and downs we've seen from, I know you mentioned Newsom and Cuomo. I, I think what we have seen through this, what has been effective is leading from a place of empathy. And that is where, when you look at all of the discussions about women running for office and, um, you know, are women strong enough leaders, uh, where empathy has been devalued in leadership. And I think that's been turned on its head uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think some of uh, Newsom well, and Cuomo's best moments were when they were following in the steps of women leadership characteristics. And, and, and that's going to be a serious shift, I think. We already saw this like wave happen in 2018 and all of these new women come in. I don't want to get on a soapbox about why I think a woman's place is in the dome. Uh, but no, please. Let, I'm sure that people want to hear it. <laughs> there's evidence. There's evidence through what we're seeing with, uh, you know, these female governors around the country and, and uh, you know, Trump's favorite targets. But there's evidence through the decision making they have had, the impact it's actually had on their communities, the numbers that have gone down, the smaller numbers of deaths. This is going to be trackable evidence of the proof of women's leadership and why it's so necessary. And, and that's why I'm hopeful also. I, it's hard to like express, America is burning. <laughs> and I've never been more hopeful about us living up to the promise of this country. Yes. Well, we're definitely at a, a, a changing point. It was a flash. This has been a flashpoint in our history. It's a, something I've never seen. I mean, I remember being a kid in New Jersey and the, the race riots in Atlantic City, people, the blacks and whites fighting and, and also growing up in a part of town where when you were told you go to high school, oh, there's black kids in high school. And then you have to get you to like, say, oh, no, what's going to happen? Everybody was so afraid. I mean, I didn't have any problems. I was six foot two, so I didn't really have any problems in high school. But some why were they afraid? Why were they afraid? Well, because of the, what, what you're what you're hearing, the rumors coming back, fights and taking your lunch money and all those things. You would hear the horror stories you would hear coming back from older brothers and sisters or maybe just rumors that people would spread around town that weren't necessarily true once you got into the system. But when you're in fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth grade and you're like, oh, boy, I got to go to Atlantic City High School from Ventnor or Margate, one of the little communities down beach. It was a big step for people that have been surrounded by white people all their lives. We had one black kid in our class of probably 300 in Ventnor. And I never realized it until a couple of years ago when I saw him at a reunion, he would get his ass kicked every day going home. And he, I told him, I was like, Dennis, oh, you, you know, we were pretty good. We had a pretty good order kids. And he's like, Kravitz, I got my ass kicked every day. And I was just like, and it was just such a reality check for me realizing that that's the kind of place I grew up in. And I really see the Trumpism and the racism firing in now over the past four years from that community that I grew up in. You're from Texas. What was it like to be a black woman growing up in Texas? Now, Austin is a little bit different. So you were lucky There's there, right? I love more than Austin, and that's America. <laughs> uh, the city is, is, is pretty dope. Uh, I, I I do have to say that, you know, hearing your story of the, your high school, it, it's just further proof. White supremacy is woven into the DNA of our culture. And it has been for our entire lives. And, and, and the amplification of uh, these stories, of these experiences, uh, it, it's certainly, it, it's being, you're feeling it in a real way right now or more real right now, but imagine you know, that same feeling being lived 
being experienced for an entire lifetime. So what has it been like <laughs> growing up in Austin as a black woman? That That's my lived experience, being the only black person in my classes, being the only black person in meetings when I went into the professional world. It is, it's your lived experience. And when people talk about rage or, uh, you know, don't understand why there would be so much anger. This is a daily situation. We are turned into fucking diamonds through this. And that's why so many black women are diamonds. But it shouldn't be that. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that every single day you walk into your home, you walk into whatever space that is going to provide comfort for you and it feels like you have to just take more weight off of you than most people carry most white people carry in a lifetime daily yeah so you were living with that all the time the little fear that we had about going to high school that was a thing you dealt with your entire life every the, day the fear of, uh, certainly not even fear because it's lit to be not to not be seen just is a thing it to be in a room fully present <laughs> fully equal and your words <laughs> uh what you bring to the table your presence is simply not acknowledged uh through you know whether it's from uh, the interaction you have with your teachers to the interactions you have with your bosses I remember a teacher I had in junior high, O'Henry Middle School. His name was Mr. Beaver. He was my homeroom teacher. Every single day he told a joke and I was the butt of his joke. And I'd tell my best friend, I don't understand why Mr. Beaver doesn't like me. And she would say every single day, what are you talking about? He's so funny. I was the butt of this man's joke. He was a white supremacist teaching seventh grade and getting away with it, getting away with that foot on who knows how many young black kids' lives, their experience, their, <laughs> their ability to start their day just feeling like a normal fucking seventh grader. You know, fuck Mr. Beaver. Yeah, but it seems like every every person of color has a Mr. Beaver and a lot of people that aren't of color, too. Uh, they have multiple, multiple Mr. Beavers, multiple <laughs> all over the place. You know, uh, I mean, from when we first met, I, <laughs> many Mr. Beavers in L.A. in the entertainment industry. It was interesting to see Blackout Tuesday and, you know, we'll see what these companies, uh, how they follow through with their commitment to take another look at how they've been doing business. Um, you know, certainly there's going to have to be some accountability, I think from the outside, some agitation to, to hold their feet to the fire. But uh, th this, this exists in every single industry, in every single state, in every single city. It's not just the South. Uh, it is, it's not just uh, white Christians. Uh, it is ingrained into the DNA of this culture. And it's finally, uh, being ripped apart. And so I'm all for this collective breakthrough we're all going through. Well, I mean, we don't really have a choice. We're in it, right? Whether we're for it or not, you know, I mean, I, I don't get the, I mean, I'm, and I'm sure every white person who's seen this riot was, I don't get the destruction, the blowing out of the towns are going in, but I get the fact that people take advantage. And I get the fact that whenever anybody sees an opportunity to go in and they don't even have to be protesting, they could just be opportunists at the time. And I think that a lot of opportunists get involved with the people that are actually protesting. I have noticed that in the in past two or three nights that a lot of the looting has stopped. I don't know if they've taken everything that they could the first time around, but I had a lot of friends that were victims of uh, their businesses being crushed right now. And it's very hard. Uh, what's your reaction to what, what the damage and what's going on and what people try to correlate that? I think about the damage that has been done to so many black bodies and minds, minds, and not just damage, but full destruction. And that's my priority. 
and I, I certainly have an understanding of why in our media narratives, looting and the limited violence uh, and the, the bad images from when the protests um, have been infiltrated by people who want to take advantage of this situation. I, I understand that media narrative. I also understand just like the original sin of devaluing black lives so that, you know, Portugal could make more money. This is about greed. And it's always about money. It's always about money. My priority is the damage that has been done to black bodies. I'm not going to fall for that distraction, that shiny object of, but wait, there has always been violence in this experiment of this country. And I don't want anyone to be further damaged through these protests, but when we try to equate the taking of a life to the taking of property, it's just not a conversation I'm here well, for. Well, you can always rebuild a building and you can always put a uh, product back on a shelf, but you can't put a, a life back into a body. And we saw that with George when he was being snuffed out. And, you know, a lot of footage has come out of that moment that I've been seeing on TV. And it's just such a mystery to me how the guy ends up from, they could have just as easily put him in the back of a squad car and shut the door and drove him downtown than, than the result they had. And I just don't get that. Does, don't the cops know that when they see one of these in their face for nine minutes while you're doing something wrong that everybody in the world's going to see it? Or is there, is there just a disconnect between, or not understanding that that's a weapon have you seen the videos of the beatings that have taken place since? Yes, George that's what I'm talking murdered. about. Nobody seen the so camera. This is, it is, it, it shouldn't be a surprise, Jeff. It shouldn't be a surprise. And for so many, I would say in, in the black community, it, it's not a surprise. The, the power dynamic that comes with complete lack of accountability. How many times has there been a video when someone was murdered by a police officer and that police officer is still walking the streets today and has never been held accountable and the residents of that city are probably still paying some sort of pension or his salary because he was rehired. George Floyd was not the first and and they're not convicted either the, uh, those three got they're not convicted either so we still have to go not through convicted, that. But when you have when police officers understand the relationships that their unions have with the cities the the very very low bar of well i felt like my life was in danger even though he was running away a hundred feet away from me. I felt like my life was in danger, even though his back was turned. And so I shot him. I felt like my life, my white life was in danger and they've gotten away with it. And so, yeah, I, I can see those cops on George Floyd, seeing the cameras around and knowing we get away with it. We always get away with it. What it's a culture! Not let's play with it this time, Jeff. Yeah, we need we need such a change in this country. I mean, it, it's never more evident, and it's almost like the the twelve weeks that we were stuck inside the house were were uh, us getting pregnant, and then we had the the baby when George went down. And the past eleven days has been just absolutely some of the most atrocious television I've ever seen in my life, and it's hard not to watch because it's like and a, it's not television; it's real it's life. Real life. And I am, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Uh, change does not happen by chance. I, I don't know if you feel this way, but you know, I will say the past three years, I have felt like, is the force with us? Do we have, is what is going on in this fucking universe that this man has gotten away with 
all that he has gotten with away. Everything. I have I I have you know questioned <laughs> until this moment. What do you think is this, is this Trump's reckoning here? It's it's America's reckoning. It's all of our reckoning. Do you blame the fact that he got rid of do you do you blame the fact that he got rid of the pandemic response team as part of the reason that we're in this in the pandemic mess that we're in? All of it. All of it. All I, I, I mean, I mean, the fact that he comes in and dismantles programs just because I mean, th th this is the crazy thing that that because Obama did. It. Obama yeah, did. It bought, because we get, went so far as a society since the past 500 years where we elected a black man president, which I don't know about you, but I thought that was the biggest stretch ever. I was like, there's no way this guy's getting in. When he won, I was shocked. I was happy. I voted for him. I was elated. I was on his side. But the fact that he got in blew me away. Then the fact that he had the uphill battle with the Senate and the House, that didn't surprise me at all because that's part of, uh, part of it. But it was frustrating trying to be on the, the side of good to see every time Mitch McConnell shitting on everything as he continues to do still and then the total knee jack reaction with the next president so total opposite and all he wants to do is take out anything he did just because his name's on it doesn't sit there and say is this good is this bad how should i deal with this just obama did it out how yeah. how Jeff, yes i i have to say that i think when president obama was elected and I feel like every time I say his name, I have to take a breath to remember what decency was like. From Talk about empathy. From a leadership standpoint. And when President Obama was elected, it allowed a lot of white people, all of the ones who voted for him perhaps, to feel good about that action of voting for him, the action of the first black president being elected in a former slave country, and not to focus on what is being focused on right now. So I, I think that while yes, uh, that was an important moment for this country, at the same time, it allowed a lot of people to sleep on their individual guilt, complicity, bias, and participation in the white supremacy that is built into the fabric of this glorious country. So that was just bubbling in the back end while this while Obama oh. was on the front and just getting worse. Oh. Uh, it's basically, but Obama, but I voted for Obama. I, I bet you, that woman in Central Park, Amy Cooper, I bet you she voted for Obama. But if, if that bird watcher had been Obama, she would have been like, there's a black man trying to hurt me. So there, there's a reckoning that needed to be done is I think we are at the, the start of it being done uh, right now. But there's, there's a reckoning that, uh, needed to be done when Obama was elected, that that act did not, it didn't clean the slate. No, well, because but again, because he was fighting forces that were against him, that were supposed to be governing with him, right? Your Senate and your Congress, just like the Senate, the Congress fights Trump, not allowing anything you do. But I agree. One of the th criticisms I've seen about black leaders is that they get in there and then they have to end up turning white kind of because they have to deal with so many different things that are wrapped up in money. And once you start dealing with money, then you're dealing with corporate. And once you deal with corporate, you can't win. There's no way you're standing up for the black man in that situation. Well, I, I mean, I, I would shift away from the black leadership point and put the focus back on, it allowed white people to excuse themselves. Um, not Obama's leadership, but the election of a black president allowed people to feel- Like they were doing something. Systemic racism did not exist in this country. Right. And. Uh, to think that it didn't exist 
in spite of Obama being elected, is also a part of how we got to watching George Floyd be murdered in front of us. So whatever uh, one person is elected or uh, one um, major victory that uh, lies ahead of us, you know, we can't be fooled into thinking that there is some cure all. <laughs> this is gonna take hard work, just like these organizers that have been doing this, every one of these videos that have come out before Ahmad, before Brianna, back to Philando Castile, back to Sandra in Houston. I mean, how many names? Each one of these organizers and community leaders around the country have been very consistent in building this movement. And that level of consistency is what is going to be required through this period. It can't just be, well, Trump's out of the White House, so racism has disappeared in America. Bullshit. <laughs> You gotta watch out for that because I think a lot of people are gonna think we solved it. Well, That's it'll just be a matter of time before we have another George Floyd, won't it be? There will be another George Floyd. There will be another name. And you know, I'm I'm saying to all my white friends when they are calling for my consolation in some way uh, and asking what they can do, I I, I've just resorted to put your body in front of a black person's body and take the blow. Whether it's a blow from a police officer, whether it's the blow from the executives at whatever company you work for, whether it's the blow on the street when you are watching literally racism being performed in front of you and you go on your merry way, whatever that blow is, take that one blow <laughs> and remove that blow from that black person's life for that day, that moment, um, and then do it again the next day, and do it again the next day, and do it again the next day. And maybe when you've taken as many blows as I have, and many black people have in this country, then we can start to talk about this plague of white supremacy on this country starting to be chipped away, starting. There's not one thing that is going to bring it to an end. Well, one, one of the big problems we have is a polarization in cash. 99% or what is it? 90% of the people, oh wait, 90% of the cash is with 1% of the people. Oh, income inequality is, is a real deal. I'm not... I'm not down for the income inequality answer being the, the solution to all of this. Uh, Cause clearly uh, income inequality didn't compel those officers to choke him out for nine minutes and murder him in front of us. That wasn't income inequality. So you know, there are a lot of progressives. There are a lot of very far left folks who want it to be all about just income inequality. And, and they have not put the work in. They've not taken the leadership. They haven't been on the front lines when it comes to fighting for racial justice. I think we are seeing that shift right now. Again, I'm hopeful. But uh, we, we, can't just to, we can't just defer to the economics of it. This is a this is. A, a system that has been built on the idea that if your skin is white, you are more valuable than a black person. And that's been taught to all of you. And it's been taught to us. Crazy. So, so the inequality is just staggering. And I just don't even know where to go. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, because we're just sitting here, we all feel helpless. What do Take you, uh, go ahead. Take a blow. Take a blow. Uh, I, I actually, uh, I was thinking about you this morning also because I, I had a photo shoot with a, a wonderful photographer here in, in Austin. Uh, she runs a company, Woke Beauty, uh, Riley Blanks. And uh, I follow her religiously on Instagram and she was sharing around, you know, the power that photographers have when it comes to telling 
black stories and you hold a lot of power in your hands through your art, through your craft and through examining how you have used that power, how you can use it more. Uh, we saw Serena's husband resign a board seat today and say, I don't wanna be on the board of the organization I founded, give my board seat to a black person. Uh, I've said politically about whether it's Bloomberg or uh, Tom Steyer, your, your California <laughs> guy, why could they, you know, yes, they understand that we needed to change the person in the White House. They could have taken their resources and invested it into one of the black women running. They could have done that. But the idea of where is my investment going to have a greater impact if I invested in myself or if I invested in this black person? Um, I, I think that's a decision that a lot of y'all should be making to take a step back to put resources uh, literally from you to another person who happens to be black. All right. Well, but, you, 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 almost, you ran for the DNC chair a couple years back. I did. I got half a vote. Oh, you got half a vote. <laughs> I got half a vote. I'm so proud of my half a vote. <laughs> Who do you see uh, being Biden's partner in the White House? The most important decision ever, right? Because this is the next president, I think, after a president Biden. I am, I, I am in love with the uh, Val Demings. I more than love Stacey Abrams. I have been a big supporter of Senator Kamala Harris, um, your senator. Uh, clearly there is a uh, similarity between all of them. I am on that page that Biden needs to pick. Well, he, he did say that, didn't he? That he was gonna pick a woman of color as his running mate. Uh, Biden needs to pick a black woman as VP. And we all need to have the conversation of even like the black lived experience is also different than just the people of color lived experience. But that's for another 420 when <laughs> maybe we're a little looser. However, uh, when you look at the votes that deliver victories for this party, if he does not pick a black woman, I would be very surprised. I think any of those three would be amazing. I, I do think Senator Harris, uh, with what's happening right now, you know, prosecutors are not are not at the top of the list for a lot of voters. Uh, the the leadership that Stacey Abrams showed uh, in her eleven years in the Georgia State House. Uh, I think a lot of people only saw her gubernatorial run and, and her work around voting. And she got robbed there too in her gubernatorial run. She did get robbed there, uh, but her state legislative leadership experience uh, by far trumps any experience that President Obama had <laughs> at the time. And so right. there are folks who are trying to say, oh, well, she doesn't have the experience. She is more experienced than the person who is the most beloved <laughs> president of our lifetime. And uh, she she could certainly do the job. And Val Demings, oh, she's a beast. All right, here, here's one for you. People are worried that there might not be an election because of our crazy ass president and the way he's talking and the vote by mail and don't vote by mail and which I vote by mail every time I vote. That's the easiest way to I vote. I, I was, you know, certainly worried that uh, what we know to be true is that this man has no boundaries when it comes to criminality. And, and so that, that did worry me. And then you know what happened? America started burning figuratively, people took to the streets to protest the murder of George Floyd in every single uh, 
uh, zip code imaginable and the, the makeup of the people who are peacefully protesting uh, has, it does, certainly doesn't look like what it did in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so while, yes, I, I was worried, I also know that where we are, this, this powder keg of a situation, people are showing they're going to turn out. And they're so- gonna and especially gonna, now, especially now i think all he's doing is motivating voters right now well i think what he's also doing is trying to give a blueprint to white supremacists to literally do crimes uh yes when he talks about like stealing ballots out of mailboxes and forging signatures on I'm pretty sure he's not talking about what he thinks is going to happen. He's saying y'all can do this. We saw that happen in North Carolina in 2018 already. Uh, and I, I think any sort of voter fraud is going to be on the part of the thugs and criminals that Donald Trump has in his camp. Uh, they will be going into black neighborhoods, trying to get ballots, trying to uh, create havoc. And, and that's what we need to watch out for. But I also know whether it's vote by mail, people are going to get out. We're seeing it right now. Oh, I'm, I'm now, feeling it. We're not Pollyannish about it. We got to make that happen. We got to yeah, make that and, happen. And I, I think the, the youth are getting in. I know Headcount is doing a great job registering people to vote. Um, do you want to talk a little about, about vote? I, I, I wrote voter on lead before. But then I was like, no, it's vote run lead. <laughs> run lead, yes. Uh, well, you know, when when all, when you go to vote, it is now more important than ever before to understand who is your city council rep, who is your mayor, who's running for state house, who's running you know, in these statewide positions, um, uh, who will have direct influence over pu public health decisions. So uh, the women who we train at Vote Run Lead, I, I think are exhibiting the exact type of leadership that is being applauded right now from Cuomo and Newsom. But where are those guys getting it from? They are getting it from the example from these local women leaders. And so make sure that this election is not just about President Trump. <laughs> this election is about all of those individuals on the ballot. I think President Obama has, has realized that when Democrats under his administration, his two terms, we lost 1,100 state ledge seats. And then they took over redistricting and gerrymandering. gerrymandering. And Mitch McConnell has all of the power that he has because of down ballot races. So we, we, we have to not allow Trump to take all of the focus and make sure that we are supporting these other good candidates um, at the local level. And that's Amen. what vote does. Men. Jamuth, thank you so much for coming on today. We're already out of time. It went so fast. And thanks for uh, educating us and making me feel like I'm not a complete idiot when it comes to this. You're not an idiot. And like I said, Jeff, thank, thank you for seeing me for who I was and for always giving me a platform in which to, to lead um, uh, in a beautiful way. I, I say that uh, because you hold a very special place in my heart as far as the trauma I went through in the <laughs> back in the day. Well, you are the good ones. <laughs> and we have our eyes focused on you, Jamu. Keep up the good work and we look forward to you leading and, and we're going to follow your lead. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, there you go. My attempt at not distracting today and staying focused, I think we achieved our goal there, which was enlightening and keeping it up. Jamu's an amazing, amazing woman. Follow her on her social media. Check out voterunlead.org. I'm sure they could use a little cash like everybody else out there. So send them a little something, something. And you know, everybody out there, I love you guys. Please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Hydrate, medicate, stay off the sugar. Although I am eating a lot of sugar. Here's the hug. Ah, Love, happiness for everybody out there. Have a great day. We will see you back here on Monday, 420. Maybe back to our usual hijinks. Maybe not. Thanks, everybody.